Hey guys, this is uh, Sumir and we are back with uh, yet another episode of uh, Telling It Like It Is. I am here today with Dr. Amir Abbas Abidevi and he was very curious about neuro-linguistic programming. As I've told a lot of people, anybody who comes to talk to me and gets close to me, I tell them two things. Read a book called The Business at the Speed of Thought by Bill Gates. Learn neuro-linguistic programming because it's a phenomenal tool for self-assessment and for communication and for a host of other things as you will see through the episode and uh, Amir was fascinated and he did a lot of uh, deep digging he also read the articles that I'd uh, written it's a series of four articles and he's got a host of questions that I guess he wants to fire at me unfiltered unedited so without any further ado I am going to hand over to Amir and go so hi guys, my name is Amir. Thank you all for joining us for this podcast. So Sumir, uh, as you have written four articles on NLP, so can you just give us an uh, understanding of NLP? NLP, not to be mistaken with natural language processing as a lot of techies and computer geeks will think it is, it's not. It's actually neuro-linguistic programming. We all have uh, intrinsic programming etched deep within us because of our upbringing, because of our nature. Therefore, we react act to certain things. There are certain words that we use, uh, certain phrases that we use, the tone of voice that we use that have a very profound impact on other people. And neuro-linguistic programming, a lot of people even call it, call it hypnosis. Uh, I just share with you. So, you know, when I, I'm very well known for writing emails, which are highly effective, sometimes they're very long. I have a track record of, you know, sending an email and always getting the response that I want. So the secret behind that is to send a communication that is so beautifully worded that it elicits the right outcome. So neuro-linguistic programming is nothing but a means to communicate. And if you communicate not just with other people, it's also getting in touch with yourself and understanding yourself. So there are certain words that we use, there are certain techniques that we use, which are very, very useful in self analysis and to analyze others as well so that's in a nutshell but as we go deeper into the subject then you'll understand exactly how it works so that in a nutshell is neuro linguistic programming in short I'll say that it is all about facilitating an outcome either for yourself or an outcome that you expect from another person under a given situation NLP has been around for a long time and you know it's kind of come up in many different ways and it's matured over a period of time it's got a very deep root in psychology because uh, it deals with the mind how people react given situations in given circumstances a lot of people in fact uh, think that it can be misused because it's a very very powerful tool and initially when you start using you becoming a, an NLP practitioner you kind of do have this tendency of having this power over other people it's something that's very powerful not to be used lightly uh, to be used very cautiously and very uh, carefully because it's something that is profoundly impactful when you when you use it on other people and even on yourself how do you come to know about NLP I by nature am not an extrovert and what people call an introverted extrovert early days i was very very shy i couldn't have a conversation in a social setting i would not make my voice heard i would be very very reluctant to speak my mind but as I went into work and into the corporate world, I realized that communication is everything. When you want something from somebody or whether somebody wants something from you, it takes a lot of understanding of what the other person is trying to convey. And it's for you to convey to the other person the meaning of what you want to say. And I, I struggled with that. My my English and my and and my and my diction and my vocabulary is very good, but somehow or the other I could never speak very confidently. So one of the organizations that I went to work for actually put me through a formal training on uh, NLP. So that actually taught me to use the power of my words and my vocabulary and my communication skills to the hidden. So that's how I started off with this NLP journey. And over the year, years, I've been a very avid practitioner, and I found that it's been of immense use both to myself and for me to do the jobs that I've kind of uh, needed to do. Most of the times, wherever I've worked, I've been called in as a person or a crisis manager, where I've been brought in to resolve a particular problem. And when you're facing crisis situation, there are many circumstances, there's different people that you deal with. And because of that, uh, your communication skills need to be very finely honed. And I found that it's been of great use to me and I've become a very strong believer and an advocate as well of NLP. So how long have you been using this? 
I would say maybe between 19 to 21 years. And I keep reading, I keep refreshing my knowledge. Uh, a lot of things come up in terms of, uh, you know, new techniques, new ways to kind of deal with situations. I try to keep on top of it. So, uh, in what ways NLP can be used? Is there a particular thing only to be in official use or anything like that? Not, not at all. Most of the time, NLP is used for official communication, but that's not a limitation at all. NLP can use for anything. You can use it to convey, convey something to your family, to your spouse, to your brothers, to your sisters. And NLP also is very closely intertwined with relationship management. I'll give you a very simple example. How do you build a rapport with a person? So if you really want to have an open and honest communication or a dialogue with somebody, you need to establish a common ground. You need to establish a rapport because that's the best way for you to resolve a conflict or a misunderstanding. So it's not just used in a corporate setting. It can be used in any setting whatsoever. So uh, in your article also, you have given a story about Mahabharata, I think. And uh, can you tell us a little the story behind the Mahabharata and all? Before I do that, I'll tell you why I chose that. So even though the Mahabharata is actually a great in Indian epic. The series of articles, even though it's based on an epic and on scripture, Indian scripture, it's not got a religious slant. I've just taken two exemplary characters to convey what the power of NLP is. So to give you the backstory in a very short span, so there are two great families, the Pandavas and the Kauravas, and most Indians will know who they are. But the Mahabharata, generally people know, the Bhagavad Gita people know. So I'll talk more about the Bhagavad Gita. But before that, the Mahabharata, these two families, there's Maharaj Pandu who dies a premature death and he's got very young kids. He has an elder brother called Dhritarashtra who's blind. And because he's blind, he's not able to take over the kingdom because he won't be an effective ruler. So he becomes a caretaker ruler till such time the sons of Maharaj Pandu become old enough and are able to inherit the kingdom. So he's just a steward. He's supposed to stay in charge till the kids grow up. But people being people, he does not now want to give up that power because his own sons have grown up. And he feels I've taken care of the kingdom and my people have taken care of the, of the, of the kingdom for so long and I don't want to give away the power. So it's the power that he's very hungry for that power and for the adulation and facilities that being a ruler kind of give him. And he doesn't want to give that away. Way. Maharaj Pandu brought up his sons and his family brought up his sons to be very meek, very humble, very kind, very righteous. So they don't want to get into a fight with their uncle to acquire the kingdom. So they always take a step back. And finally, when push comes to shove, they just ask, they say, okay, fine, we don't want the kingdom, but just give us a few villages where we can go and establish our own little territory or our own kingdom. And even that is denied to them. So, why, why is that? Uh, because they believe that giving them a toehold will kind of give them hopes and aspirations to expand their kingdom and sometime there will be a conflict. So the decision on uh, Dhritarashtra and his side is that don't give them a toehold at all. But all the older and wiser people counsel the Pandavas saying, you know what, you're in the path of dharma, you're doing the right thing. You can't just give away this because you guys will be the righteous rulers and you'll do good for the kingdom. So you've got to fight for your right. And that's the backdrop. What happens is that the Pandavas, they go to Krishna. So there are two choices. Either they get Krishna's army, which is a huge army and a very mighty army, or then they get Krishna. But because they're so close to Krishna and they know that he's very, very uh, erudite, very wise, they prefer to get Krishna's counsel rather than his army. So they get one man as opposed to an entire army and Krishna's army goes to the Kauravas. But they were doing the right thing because if you see the entire narrative as we go through it, what you'll see if you ever read the Bhagavad Gita, there are certain verses, you know, chapter 1, chapter 2, where there's this whole dialogue between Arjuna and Krishna. Cutting to the chase, they've decided to go to battle. Now when Arjuna comes to the battlefield, with Krishna. Now Krishna becomes Arjuna's charioteer. But there's a deeper and profound meaning behind that. Krishna is not just the charioteer. What is the role of Krishna as a charioteer? His role is to navigate the chariot through the battlefield in such a way that Arjuna is always protected and he doesn't fall into any trouble. So that leaves Arjuna open to fight as opposed to navigate the battlefield. If you extrapolate that and you abstract that, so Krishna's role actually is to guide Arjun through a labyrinth, through a maze. And what is that maze? It's the confusion in Arjuna's mind. Now, why is Arjuna confused? Arjuna is a very learned man. He's the greatest warrior on the face of the planet. And he can defeat any army. Now he has a big dilemma on his hands. What is the dilemma? The dilemma is, so because the families were related, certain relatives aligned themselves with Dhritarashtra and certain relatives aligned themselves with 
Arjuna and with the Pandavas. So when he comes to the battlefield, he tells Krishna, please draw the chariot between the two armies so that I can see who's on the opposite side. And when he looks at the flanks on the opposite side, he sees uncles, cousins, the entire family. Some are close relatives, some are distant relatives, some were friends uh, aligned against each other. And he now completely loses it and he says, my, my knees are quivering. I can no longer stand. My body is burning. I can't think straight. And he's got this bow, the famous bow called the Gandiva. And the Gandiva slips from his hand and he says, he tells Krishna, I will not fight. That is how this all starts. Now, as I said, Krishna's role is that not just to drive the chariot, but to guide Arjuna. That is where the whole story starts, where Arjuna gives up and he says, I cannot fight. And Krishna's job now is to bring Arjuna back on track and says, finish your mission. This is your dharma. You are supposed to fight for your rights. You can't just take defeat and you know. Arjuna makes a whole bunch of excuses and then he rationalizes why he won't fight. And how Krishna step by step, systematically using different tools and techniques which are all NLP, bring Arjuna back on track. I'll give you a simple thing. Forget about the Mahabharata. Forget about Arjuna. Forget about Krishna. Now imagine that this company is called Pandava Incorporated. Krishna is the chairman of the company. Arjuna has been hired as the managing director of this company. Now when you are hired into a corporate, you are supposed to do a certain job. Yeah. What is Arjuna's job? Arjuna's job is to go and win the battle, to fight. And he says, I'm not going to fight. So if you're hired into an organization, you're paid a compensation. If somebody's paying you a com compensation, you're supposed to do what you're supposed to do. Krishna is the chairman of this company and he says, my managing director is saying that I can't do the job that I was hired to do. So now Krishna's job as the chairman, he's got two choices. He can terminate Arjuna and says, take a walk. I'll find somebody else. Or yes, or he can now try to get Arjuna back on track. So there's also a saying, it says a known devil is better than an unknown devil. So what does Krishna do? He says, okay, let me see if I can guide him, coax him, cajole him, counsel him, chastise him, scold him, encourage him. All of these are NLP techniques. So he uses perfect NLP techniques to get Arjuna back on track. So that's the backdrop of this entire why I call it Krishna and NLP.